Uh, well, good afternoon and welcome to the Brookings Institution, both those of you who are here and uh, those who are uh, watching on the webcast. Uh, I'm Cameron Carey. I'm the uh, Ann R. and Andrew H. Uh, Tisch uh, Visiting Fellow here at the Brookings uh, Institution. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, not only welcome all of you, but to uh, welcome uh, Bob Litt today. Uh, before I introduce Bob, um, let me remind you to please silence your cell phones. Uh, you don't need to turn them off because we encourage you to, uh, to tweet uh, on these proceedings uh, and you can use the hashtag uh, ODNI. Uh, so uh, this is not the first time that uh, Bob has come to this platform at the Brookings Institution. Um, he uh, was one of the um, uh, the early confirmees uh, uh, in the Obama administration, uh, part of the national security team, uh, and has been there uh, now for more than uh, five years as, uh, at ODNI. Um, I recall um, when I was part of the administration and the Snowden stories broke, uh, reaching out uh, to Bob almost first thing to say that I thought uh, that as part of the response, it was important uh, to put as much out there uh, in the public as possible um, uh, to address what the real scope uh, of surveillance is um, and also to make clear uh, you know, what some of the measures uh, uh, that were uh, being taken to uh, to limit uh, that surveillance to provide oversight. Um, uh, and I recall uh, Bob responding, I'm trying. Uh, well, uh, for uh, the, well, the uh, 18 months or more since then, uh, uh, he has been in the middle of that response. And he came to uh, Brookings in the summer of 2013, uh, you know, uh, within uh, less than two months uh, after those stories began, uh, and you know, began to lay out uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, some of the facts, some of the administration's response. And uh, it was really the first real substantive uh, response on these issues. So uh, we sort of bookend uh, some of that today. Obviously, since, uh, since Bob was here in July of 2013, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot has happened. Um, and he'll uh, certainly describe some of that. But uh, a year ago, uh, you know, the, after the president himself um, and his administration and his cabinet were deeply engaged in these issues. Uh, uh, the president went to uh, the Justice Department to uh, announce uh, steps being taken to, uh, to limit uh, the uh, Section 215 program uh, uh, to uh, you know, strengthen some of the oversight on the uh, Section 702 uh, uh, email uh, collection, um, and also to announce uh, uh, that U.S. signals intelligence uh, activities must include uh, appropriate safeguards for the personal information of individuals, uh, regardless of the nationality uh, of the individual to whom the information pertains uh, or where the individual resides, uh, to extend to non-U.S. persons uh, uh, equivalent protections uh, uh, to those for U.S. Uh, persons. Um, last fall, uh, the new uh, Vice President uh, for the Digital Single Market in the European Union, Vice President uh, Andros Ansip, uh, told the Parliament that this uh, was a remarkable speech, um, a really strong uh, political statement. Uh, uh, that we've waited for that kind of statement during the last uh, 10 years, but we did not get that kind of statement from the United States. Uh, um, but now there is a clear political guideline, uh, and we will see 
uh, whether Americans are able to make this guideline, this principle, uh, a reality. So I'm pleased uh, now to uh, invite Bob uh, to come and tell us about what uh, has been done to implement uh, uh, the President's uh, uh, policy declaration in uh, Presidential Policy Directive 28 and his surveillance speech um, and what has been done uh, to make the principles uh, uh, a reality. Bob, welcome back. Well, thank you for that nice introduction, Cam. Um, as Cam said, um, a year and a half ago in July 2013, uh, I gave a speech here. Uh, it was called Privacy, Technology, and National Security. The speech was just about a month after the classified documents that uh, Edward, stolen, Edward Snowden had stolen began appearing in the press at a time when people in the United States and around the world were raising questions about the legality and the wisdom of our signals intelligence activities. My speech had several purposes. <clears throat> First, I wanted to set out the legal framework under which we conduct signals intelligence and the extensive oversight of that activity by all branches of government. Second, I wanted to explain how we protect both privacy and national security in a changing technology and security environment, and in particular, how we protect privacy through robust restrictions on the use we can make of the data we collect. And third, I wanted to <clears throat> demystify and correct misapprehensions about the two programs that had been the subject of the leaks, and to commit the intelligence community to greater transparency going forward. I began that speech by noting the huge amount of private information that we all expose today through social media, electronic commerce, and so on. But I acknowledge that giving the government access to that same kind of information worries us a lot more, with good reason, because of what the government has the power to do with that information. So I suggested that we should address that problem directly. And in fact, I said, we can and we do protect both privacy and national security by a regime that puts limits uh, not only on collection, but also restricts access to and use of the data we collect based on factors such as the sensitivity of the data, the volume of the collection, how it was collected, and the reason for which it was collected, and that backs up those restrictions with technological and human controls and auditing. And this approach has been largely effective. The information that's come out in the year and a half since my speech, both licitly and illicitly, has validated the statement I made then. While there have been technological challenges and human error in our current signals intelligence activities, there has been no systematic abuse or misuse akin to the very real illegalities and abuses of the 1960s and 1970s. Well, you may have noticed that my speech did not entirely put the public concerns to rest. Questions have continued to be asked, and we've continued to try to address them. And as Cam mentioned, uh, just over a year ago, President Obama gave a speech about surveillance reform and issued Presidential Policy Directive 28, or PPD 28. The President reaffirmed the critical importance of signals intelligence activity to protect our national security and that of our allies against terrorism and other threats. But he took note of the concerns that had been raised, and he directed a number of reforms to, and I'm quoting here, give the American people greater confidence that their rights are being protected even as our intelligence and law enforcement agencies maintain the tools they need to keep us safe, end quote, as well as to provide, quote, ordinary citizens in other countries confidence that the United States respects their privacy too. The intelligence community has spent the year since the president's speech implementing the reforms he set out, as well as many of the recommendations of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Bo Oversight Board, or, or PCLOB, and the president's review group on intelligence and communications technology. And I just note in passing that last week the PCLOB issued a report finding that we have in fact made substantial progress towards implementing the great majority of its recommendations. We've also consulted with privacy groups, industry, Congress, and foreign partners. In particular, we have a robust ongoing dialogue with our European allies and partners about privacy and data protection. We've participated in a wide variety of public events at which reform proposals have been discussed and debated. And yesterday, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a report detailing the concrete steps that we've taken so far, along with the actual agency policies that implement some of those reforms. What I'd like to do today is drill down a little bit on what we've done in the last year 
and in particular explain how what we've done is responsive to some of the concerns that have been raised about our surveillance activities. I want to begin by laying out some premises that I think are commonly agreed upon and that should frame how we think about signals intelligence. The first is that we still need to conduct signals intelligence. As the President said in his speech last year, the challenges posed by threats like terrorism and proliferation and cyber attacks are not going away anytime soon. If anything, as recent events show, they are growing. Signals intelligence activities play an indispensable role in how we learn about and protect against these threats. Second, to be effective, our signals intelligence activities have to take account of the changing technological and communications environment. Fifty years ago, we could more easily isolate the communications of our target. The paradigm of electronic surveillance back then was two alligator clips on the target's telephone line. Today, digital communications are all mingled together and traverse the globe. The communications of our adversaries are not separate and easily identified streams, but are part of an ocean of irrelevant conversations, and that creates new challenges for us. Third, it's critical to keep in mind that signals intelligence, like all foreign intelligence, is fundamentally different from electronic surveillance for law enforcement purposes. It, In the typical law enforcement context, a crime has been or is about to be committed, and the goal is to gather evidence about that particular crime. Intelligence, on the other hand, is often an effort to find out what is going to happen so that we can prevent it from happening or simply to keep policymakers informed. This means that we cannot limit our signals intelligence activities only to targeted collection against specific individuals whom we've already identified. We have to try to uncover threats or adversaries of which we may as yet be unaware, such as hackers seeking to penetrate our systems or potential terrorists or people supplying nuclear weapons to nuclear materials to proliferators. Or we may simply be seeking information to support the nation's political leadership in the service of other foreign policy interests. Fourth, we can also agree that, in part because of the considerations I've just articulated, Signals intelligence activities can present special challenges to privacy and civil liberties. The capacity to listen in on private conversations or to read online communications, if not properly limited and constrained, could impinge upon legitimate privacy interests or could be misused for improper purposes. Finally, as the President also said, quote, for our intelligence community to be effective over the long haul, we must maintain the trust of the American people and people around the world. So although we must continue to conduct signals intelligence activities to protect our national security and those of others, we need to do so in a way that is consistent with our values, that treats all people with dignity and respect, that takes account of the concerns that people have with the potential intrusiveness of these activities, and that ultimately provides reassurance to the public that they are conducted within appropriate limits and oversight. So with these premises, let me address some of the concerns that people have raised about our signals intelligence activities. I want to first start with the issue of transparency, both because it's something I care about deeply and because our commitment to transparency is what enables me to explain the other changes I'm going to talk about today. One of the biggest challenges that we've faced over the last year and a half is that to a great extent our intelligence activities have to be kept secret. The public does not know everything that's done in its name and that has to be so. If we re reveal too much about our intelligence activities, we will compromise the capability of those activities to protect the nation. And I want to reiterate what I've said before. There have been significant benefits from the recent public debate, but the leaks have unquestionably caused damage to our national security, damage whose full extent we will not know for years. We've seen public postings clearly talking about the disclosures. Such a one, for one example is an extremist who advised others to stop using a particular communications platform because the company provided, that provided that platform, which had been discussed in the leaked documents, was, quote, part of NSA. So as I said, we're not going to know for a long time how much damage we've suffered, but we have suffered damage. And yet, the intelligence community, from the Director of National Intelligence on down, recognizes that with secrecy inevitably come both suspicion and the possibility of abuse. I and many others firmly believe that there would have been less public outcry from the leaks of the last year and a half if we had been more transparent about our activities beforehand. In fact, as we've been able to release more information, I think it's helped to allay some of the misimpressions people have had about what we do. 
And so we have committed ourselves to disclosing more information about our signals intelligence activities when the public interest in disclosure outweighs the risk to national security. Some examples. We've declassified thousands of pages of court filings, opinions, procedures, compliance reports, congressional notifications, and other documents. We've released summary statistics about our use of surveillance authorities, and we've authored, authorized providers to release aggregate information as well. <laughs> Representatives of the intelligence community have appeared and spoken in numerous public forums such as this one. We've also changed the way we disclose information to enable greater access by establishing a Tumblr account where we post declassified documents, official statements, and other materials. It's called IC on the Record. Finally, we've developed and issued principles of transparency to apply to all of our intelligence activities going forward. The process of transparency is never going to move as quickly as we would like. Public interest declassification requires a meticulous review to ensure that we don't inadvertently release information that needs to remain classified. And we have limited resources to devote to that task. The same people who review documents for this kind of discretionary declassification also have to review thousands of do documents implicated by FOIA requests with judicial deadlines. And all this on top of their day job of actually working to keep us safe. Nonetheless, we recognize the importance of transparency and are committed to continuing it. In general, our efforts at transparency have focused and will continue to focus on enhancing the public's overall understanding of the intelligence community's mission and how we accomplish that mission, while continuing to protect specific targets of surveillance, specific means by which we conduct surveillance, specific partnerships, specific intelligence we gather. It's particularly important that we give the public greater insight into the laws and policies that we operate under and how we interpret those authorities, into the limits we impose on our activities, and into our oversight and compliance regime. I hope that our continuing efforts at transparency will demonstrate to the American people and the rest of the world that our signals intelligence activities are not arbitrary and are conducted responsibly and pursuant to law. Now, one persistent but mistaken charge in the wake of the leaks has been that our signals intelligence activity is overly broad, that it's not adequately overseen, and is subject to abuse, that in short, NSA collects whatever it wants. This is and always has been a myth. But in addition to greater transparency about what we do, we've taken a number of concrete steps to reassure the public that we conduct signals intelligence activity only within the scope of our legal authorities and applicable policy limits. To begin with, in PPD 28, the President set out a number of important general principles that govern all of our signals intelligence activities. The collection of signals intelligence must be authorized by statute or presidential authorization and must be conducted in accordance with the Constitution and the law. Privacy and civil liberties must be integral considerations in planning signals intelligence activity. Signals intelligence will be collected only when there is a valid foreign intelligence or counterintelligence purpose. We will not conduct signals intelligence activities for the purpose of suppressing criticism or dissent. We will not use signals intelligence to disadvantage people based on their ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. We will not use signals intelligence to afford a competitive commercial advantage to US companies and business sectors. And our signals intelligence activity must always be as tailored as feasible, taking into account the availability of other sources of information. In addition to these general principles, the President directed that we set up processes to ensure that we adhere to them and that we have appropriate policy review of our signals intelligence collection. I want to spend a little time talking about what these processes are, how it is that we try to ensure that signals intelligence is collected only in appropriate circumstances. And you will forgive me if I get down a little bit into the weeds on this, because I think it's important for people to understand. To begin with, neither NSA nor any intelligence agency decides on its own what to collect. Each year, the highest priorities for our, for our foreign intelligence collection are set by the President after an extensive and formal interagency process. And as a result of PPD 28, going forward, the rest of our intelligence priorities are also reviewed and approved through a high-level interagency process. As a result, overall, this process will ensure that all of our intelligence priorities are set by senior policymakers who are in the best position to identify our foreign intelligence requirements and that those policymakers take into account not only the potential value of intelligence collection, but also the risks of that collection, including the risks to privacy, national economic interests, and foreign relations. 
Now, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, then translates these priorities into a document called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, or the NIPIF. Our intelligence community directive about the NIPIF, which is ICD-204, and incorporates the requirements of PPD-28, is publicly available on our website. The NIPIF itself is classified, but much of what's in the NIPIF is reflected annually in the DNI's unclassified worldwide threat assessment. But the priorities that are set in the NIPIF are at a fairly high level of generality, like uh, the pursuit of nuclear and ballistic capabilities by particular foreign adversaries, the effects of drug cartel corruption in a particular country, human rights abuses in identified countries. And these priorities apply not just to signals intelligence, but to all of our intelligence activities. So how do the priorities that are set in the NIPIF get translated into actual signals collection activities? The organization that's responsible for doing this is called the National Signals Intelligence Committee, or SIGCOM. We have, have to have an acronym for everything. It's the SIGCOM. It operates under the auspices of the director of the National Security Agency, who's designated by Executive Order 12333 as what we call the functional manager for signals intelligence, responsible for overseeing and coordinating signals intelligence activity across the intelligence community under the oversight of the Secretary of Defense and the DNI. The SIGCOM has representatives from all elements of the intelligence community, and as we fully implement PPD-28, we'll also have full representation from other departments and agencies with a policy interest in signals intelligence. All departments and agencies that are consumers of signals intelligence submit their requests for collection to the SIGCOM. The SIGCOM then reviews these requests, ensures that they are consistent with the NIPIF, and assigns them priorities using criteria such as can SIGINT provide useful information in this case? Perhaps imagery or human sources would be better or more cost-effective sources to address this particular requirement. How critical is the information need? Generally, if it's a high priority in the NIPIF, it'll be a high SIGINT priority. What type of SIGINT could we direct to, to collect this information? We collect different kinds of signals intelligence. There's what we commonly think of, which is communications intelligence. But there's also collection against foreign weapon systems, which is called FISINT. And there's other foreign electronic collection, which we call ILINT. Is the collection as tailored as feasible, or should there be time, focus, or other limitations on it? And our signals intelligence requirements also require explicit consideration of other factors. Is the target of collection or the methodology, or the methodology used to collect particularly sensitive? If so, it will require review by senior policymakers. Will the collection present an unwarranted risk to privacy and civil liberties, regardless of nationality? And are the, should there be additional dissemination and retention safeguards to the information we collect in order to protect privacy or national security interests? So at the end of the SIGCOM process, a limited number of trained NSA personnel take the priorities that the SIGCOM has validated and research and identify specific selection terms, such as telephone numbers or email addresses, that are expected to be able to collect foreign intelligence responsive to these priorities. Any selector has to be reviewed and approved by two persons before it's entered into NSA's collection system. Even then, however, whether and when collection takes place will obviously depend on additional considerations, such as the availability of appropriate collection resources. And of course, when collection is conducted pursuant to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, we have to apply additional restrictions approved by the court. So that's the process by which we ensure that signals intelligence collection re targets reflect valid and important foreign intelligence needs. But as is typically the case with our signals intelligence activities, we don't simply set rules and processes at the front end, but we have mechanisms to ensure that we are complying with those rules and processes. Cabinet officials are required to validate the SIGINT requirements every year. NSA checks the targets that they're collecting against throughout the collection process to determine if they are, in fact, providing valuable intelligence responsive to the priorities, and they'll stop collection against targets that are not. In addition, all selection terms are reviewed annually by supervisors. Based on a recommendation from the President's Review Group, the DNI has established a new mechanism to monitor the collection and dissemination of signals intelligence that is particularly sensitive because of the nature of the target or the means of collection to ensure that it is consistent with determinations of policymakers. And finally, ODNI annually reviews the IC's allocation of resources against the NIPIF priorities and against the intelligence mission as a whole. 
This review includes assessment of the values of all types of intelligence collection, including SIGINT, and looks both backwards, how successful have we been at achieving the goals we set, and forward, what are we going to need in the future. And the proce this process overall helps ensure that our SIGINT resources are applied only to the most important national intelligence priorities. The point I want to make with this perhaps excessively detailed description is that the intelligence community does not decide on its own what conversations to listen to, nor does it try to collect everything. Its activities are focused on priorities set by policymakers through a process that involves input from across the government and that is overseen within uh, the government, both by ODNI and the Department of Defense and through extensive processes within NSA. The processes put in place by PPD 28, which are described in the report we issued yesterday, have further strengthened this oversight to ensure that our signals intelligence activities are conducted for appropriate foreign intelligence purposes and with full consideration of the risks of collection as well as the benefits. Now, one of the principal concerns that has been raised both here and abroad is with bulk collection. Bulk collection is not the same thing as bulky collection. Even a narrowly targeted collection program can collect a great deal of data. Rather, bulk collection as we use it generally refers to collection that is not targeted by the use of terms such as a person's phone number or email address. We do bulk collection for a number of reasons, although like all of our intelligence activities, bulk collection always must be for a valid foreign intelligence or counterintelligence purpose. In some circumstances, for example, it may not be technically possible to target a specific person or selector. In other circumstances, we need to have a pool of data to review as circumstances arise, data which might otherwise not be available because it would have been deleted or overwritten. For one of the things we use metadata for, for example, is to help identify targets for more intrusive surveillance. But because bulk collection is not targeted, it often involves the collection of information that ultimately is not of foreign intelligence value along with information that is and it's therefore important that we regulate it appropriately. We've taken a number of steps to provide appropriate and transparent limits on our bulk collection activities. First, agency procedures governing signals intelligence now explicitly provide that collection should be targeted rather than bulk whenever practicable. Second, the president in PPD 28 required that when we do collect signals intelligence in bulk, we can only use it for one of six enumerated purposes, which I can paraphrase as countering espionage and other threats from foreign powers, counterterrorism, counterproliferation, cybersecurity, protecting our forces, and combating transnational criminal threats. We cannot take information collected in bulk and trawl through it for any reason we please. We have to be able to confirm that we are using it for one of the six specified purposes. Agencies that have access to signals intelligence collected in bulk have incorporated these limitations in procedures governing their use of signals intelligence, which we've released yesterday. This is not a meaningless step. It means that violations of those restrictions are subject to oversight, and significant violations have to be reported to the DNI. Third, in PPD 28, the President directed my boss, the DNI, to study whether there were software-based solutions that could eliminate the need for bulk collection. The DNI commissioned a study from the National Academy of Sciences, which was conducted by a team of independent experts. To summarize, they, I'm sorry, they issued their report a few weeks ago, and it's publicly available. Summarizing it, they concluded that to the extent the goal of bulk collection is, as I said a moment ago, to enable us to look backwards when we discover new facts, for example, to see if a terrorist who's arrested overseas has ever been in contact with people in the United States, there are no software-based solutions today that could accomplish that goal, but that we could explore ways to use technology to provide more effective limits and controls on the uses we make of bulk data and uh, to more effectively target our collection. And I will return to technology towards the end of my, my remarks. To be clear, the National Academy of Sciences report doesn't purport to settle whether bulk collection is a good idea or whether it's valuable. It simply concludes that present technology does not allow other less intrusive ways of accomplishing the same goals that we can achieve today with bulk collection. Finally, with respect to bulk collection, the President directed specific steps to address concerns about the bulk collection of telephone metadata pursuant to FISA court order under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act. You will recall that this was the program that was set up to fix a gap identified in the wake of 9-11 
to provide a tool that can enable us to identify potential terrorist confederates of foreign terrorists. I won't explain in detail this program and the extensive controls it operates under because by now most of you are familiar with it. There's a wealth of information available about it at IC on the record. Some have claimed that this program is illegal or unconstitutional, although the vast majority of judges who have considered it to date have determined that it's lawful. People have also claimed that the program is useless because they say it's never stopped a terrorist plot. While we have provided examples where the program has proved valuable, I don't happen to think that the number of plots foiled is the only metric to assess its value. It's more like an insurance policy, which provides valuable protection even though you may never file a claim. And because the program involves only metadata about communications and is subject to very strict limitations and controls, the privacy concerns that it raises, while not non-existent by any means, are far less substantial than they would be if we were collecting the full content of those communications. Even so, the President recognized the public concerns about this program and ordered that several steps be taken immediately to limit it. In particular, except in emergency situations, NSA must now obtain the FISA Court's advance agreement that there is a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a number being used to query the database is associated with a specific foreign terrorist organization. And the results that an analyst get back from a query are now limited to numbers in direct contact with the query numbers and numbers in contact with those numbers, what we call two hops, instead of three as it used to be. Longer term, as you know, the President directed us to find a way to preserve the essential capabilities of the program without having the government hold the metadata in bulk. In furtherance of this direction, we worked extensively with Congress on a bipartisan basis and with privacy and civil liberties groups on the USA Freedom Act. This was not a perfect bill. It went further than some proponents of national security would wish, and it did not go as far as some advocacy groups would wish. But it was the product of a series of compromise, and if enacted, it would have accomplished the President's goal. It would have prohibited bulk collection under Section 215 and other authorities, but it also would have authorized a new mechanism that, based on the telecommunications provider's current practice in retaining telephone metadata, would have preserved the existing capabilities of the, uh, the essential capabilities of the existing program. Having invested a great deal of time in those negotiations, I was personally disappointed that the Senate failed by two votes to advance the bill. And with Section 215 sunsetting on June 1 of this year, I hope that Congress acts expeditiously to pass the USA Freedom Act or another bill that accomplishes the President's goal. Another set of concerns that people raised centered around the other program that was leaked, collection under Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Section 702 enables us to target non-U.S. persons located outside of the United States for foreign intelligence purposes with the compelled assistance of domestic communications service providers. Contrary to what some people claim, this is not bulk collection. All of the collection is based on selectors such as telephone numbers or email addresses that we have reason to believe are being used by non-U.S. persons abroad to communicate or receive foreign intelligence information. Again, there's ample information about this program and how it operates on IC on the record. Unlike the bulk telephone metadata program, no one really dis disagrees that this program is an effective and important source of foreign intelligence information. Rather, the concerns about this statute, at least within the United States, have to do with the fact that even when we are targeting non-U.S. persons, we are inevitably going to collect the communications of some U.S. persons, either because they're talking to our foreign targets or in some limited circumstances because we cannot technically separate the communications we're looking for from others. This is called incidental collection because we aren't targeting the U.S. person. And I want to stress that when Congress passed Section 702, it fully understood that this kind of in incidental collection was going to occur. Some of this incidental collection may prove to be foreign, useful and important foreign intelligence information. To pick the most obvious example, if a foreign terrorist who we're targeting under Section 702 is giving instructions to a confederate in the United States, we need to be able to identify this communication and follow up, even if we weren't targeting the U.S. person herself. But people have asked, and they're legitimate questions, what are we allowed to do with communications that aren't of foreign intelligence value, but maybe, for example, evidence of a crime? And to what extent should we be allowed to rummage through the database of communications we collect to look for communications of U.S. persons? Part of the problem was that the general public didn't even know what the rules governing our activity under Section 702 were. And so we have declassified and released yesterday 
the, the procedures for minimizing the collection, retention, and dissemination of U.S. persons under Section 702 of the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. But to address these concerns further, the President in his speech directed the Attorney General and the DNI to, quote, institute reforms that place additional restriction on government's ability to retain, search, and use in criminal cases communications between Americans and foreign citizens incidentally collected under Section 702. And we're doing that. First, as the PCLOB rec recommended, agencies have new restrictions on their ability to look through 702 collection for information about U.S. persons. The agency's various rules are described in the report we issued yesterday and their procedures. It's important to note that different agencies in the intelligence community have been charged by Congress and the President with focusing on different intelligence activities. For example, NSA focuses on signals intelligence, CIA primarily collects human intelligence, and the FBI has a domestic law enforcement focus. Because the agency's missions are different, their internal government, governance and their IT systems have developed differently from one another. And so the specifics of their procedures differ from one another. But, they, but all of the procedures will ensure that information about U.S. persons incidentally collected pursuant to Section 702 is only made available to analysts and agents when it's appropriate. We've also reaffirmed that intelligence agencies must delete communications that we acquire under Section 702 that are to, from, or about U.S. persons if those communications are determined to lack foreign intelligence value. And we've strengthened oversight of that requirement. Finally, the government will use information acquired under Section 702 as evidence in a criminal case only in cases related to national security or for certain other enumerated serious crimes and only when the Attorney General approves. And in that respect, I just want to note that uh, this morning's uh, press reports that the Director of National Intelligence's General Counsel uh, told uh, reporters yesterday that we hadn't uh, devised the list of crimes yet. Uh, the General Counsel for the Director of National Intelligence forgot that, in fact, we had. Um, and so today I want to say that, that in fact, the list of, cr of crimes other than national security crimes for which we can use Section 702 information about U.S. persons is uh, crimes involving death, kidnapping, substantial bodily harm, conduct that is a specified offense against a minor as defined in a particular statute, incapacitation or destruction of critical infrastructure, cybersecurity, transnational, human, transnational crimes, or human trafficking. Other than those crimes, we cannot use Section 702 information about an American in a case against that American. In short, we have taken concrete steps to ensure that there are limits on our ability to identify and use information about U.S. persons that we incidentally collect pursuant to Section 702. But a refrain that we often hear from our par foreign partners is that our rules are focused only on protecting Americans and that we ignore the legitimate privacy interests of other persons around the world. The fact that we have strong protections for the rights of our citizens is hardly surprising, and I am not going to apologize for it. Indeed, the legal regimes of most, if not all, countries afford greater protection to their own citizens or residents than to foreigners outside of the country. Nonetheless, it has never been true that the intelligence community had a sort of open season to spy on foreigners around the world. We've always been, able, have been required to limit our collection to, foreign, to valid intelligence purposes, as I said out above. However, the President recognized that given the power and scope of our signals intelligence activities, we need to do more to reassure the world that, quote, we, that we treat, quote, all persons with dignity and respect, regardless of their nationality and where they might reside, and that we provide appropriate protections for the, quote, legitimate privacy interests of all persons in the handling of their personal information. And so, uh, the PBD 28 contains Section 4, which I happen to think is an extraordinarily significant step because it requires that we have express limits on the retention and dissemination of personal in information about non-U.S. persons collected by signals intelligence comparable to the limits that we have for U.S. persons. These rules are incorporated into agency procedures that we released yesterday and into another publicly available document, Intelligence, Intelligence Community Directive 203, which it governs analytic standards in reporting. With respect to retention, we now have explicit rules that require that personal information about non-U.S. persons that we collect through SIGINT must generally be deleted after five years unless comparable information about a U.S. person would be retained. And we've likewise prohibited the dissemination of personal information about non-U.S. persons 
unless comparable information about U.S. persons could be disseminated. In particular, and this is a, a very significant point, SIGINT information about the routine activities of foreign persons is not considered foreign intelligence that could be disseminated by virtue of that fact alone unless it's otherwise responsive to an authorized foreign intelligence requirement. And I want to stop and, and, and highlight that point because in, in um, the many discussions that I've had over the last year and a half with our foreign partners about our uh, signals intelligence activity, I've repeatedly made the point that we only uh, collect and retain and disseminate uh, information about foreign persons when it's valid foreign intelligence information. And they have come back at me and pointed out that uh, the definition of foreign intelligence that we have in Executive Order 12333 includes information about, quote, the capabilities, intentions, or activities of foreign persons. And so then they've said, well, that really provides no limitation at all, because if it's about a foreign person, uh, it's considered foreign intelligence. And so the new procedures address this concern by making clear that just because uh, an intelligence community officer has signals intelligence information about a foreign person does not mean that she can disseminate this as foreign intelligence unless there is some other basis to consider it valid foreign intelligence information responsive to one of the priorities that we set out before. In short, for the first time, our nation has instituted express and transparent requirements to take account of the privacy of persons who are not our citizens or residents in how we conduct some of our intelligence activities. These new protections are, I think, a demonstration of our nation's enduring commitment to respecting the personal privacy and human dignity of citizens of all countries. There's much more that we've done over the last year, but I'm running short of time, if indeed I haven't run over already. Uh, the administration has endorsed changes to the operation of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that were contained in the USA Freedom Act, not because the court is a rubber stamp, as some have charged. The documents that we've released over the last year and a half should make clear that it's not, but in order to reassure the public. These include creation of a panel of lawyers who can advocate for privacy interests in appropriate cases and continued declassification and release of significant court opinions. We're taking steps to limit the length of time that secrecy can be imposed on recipients of national security letters. We're continuing to implement rules to protect intelligence community whistleblowers who report through proper channels. These steps are discussed more fully in the materials we released yesterday. So where do we go from here? The president has directed that we report again in one year, and we'll do so. In the interim, we will continue to, in to implement the reforms that the president directed in PPD 28 and his speech. We'll declassify and release more information. We'll continue to institutionalize transparency, and we'll continue our public dialogue and dialogue with our foreign partners on these issues. We'll work with Congress to secure passage of the USA Freedom Act or something like that. And I hope that we'll be able to work together with industry to help us find better solutions to protect both privacy and national security. One of the many ways in which Snowden's leaks have damaged our national security is by driving a wedge between government and providers and, techno and technology companies so that some companies that formerly recognized that protecting our nation was a valuable and important public service they could perform now feel compelled to stand in opposition. I don't happen to think that's healthy because I think that American companies have a huge amount to contribute to how we protect both privacy and national security. When people talk about technology and surveillance, they tend to talk about either how techno technology has enabled the intelligence community to do all sorts of scary things, or on the other hand, how technology can help pr protect us from all the scary things that the intelligence community can do. There's a third role that technology can play, however, and that's to provide protections and restrictions on the national security apparatus that can provide assurance to Americans and people around the world that we are respecting the appropriate limits on intelligence activities while still protecting national security. This is where the genius and the capabilities of America's technology companies can provide us invaluable assistance. And in this regard, I'd like to point back to the National Academy of Sciences report that I mentioned earlier. The last section of that report identifies a number of areas where they say technology could help us target signals intelligence collection more effectively or could provide more robust, transparent, and protection, and tran sorry, more, more robust, transparent, and effective protections for privacy including uh, enforceable limitations on the use of the data we collect. One particular challenge they mentioned is the spread of encryption. And in my view, this is an important area where we should look to the private sector to provide solutions. I should emphasize here, by the way, that I'm speaking only for myself. 
Encryption is a critical tool to protect privacy, to facilitate commerce, and to provide security, and the United States government supports its widespread use. At the same time, the widespread use of encryption that cannot be decrypted when we have the lawful authority to do so runs a risks allowing criminals, terrorists, hackers, and other threats to avoid detection. As President Obama recently said, quote, if we get into a situation in which the technologies do not allow us at all to track someone that we're confident that is a terrorist, that's a problem, end quote. I'm not a cryptographer, but I am an optimist. I believe that if our businesses, our, our scientists, and our academics put their mind to it, they will find a solution that does not compromise the integrity of encryption technology, but that enables both encryption to protect privacy and decryption under lawful authority to protect national security. And so with that final plea for assistance, let me stop and take your questions or take Cam's questions or whatever's next on the agenda. Thank you. And I fulfilled my promise. Uh, there, there's a lot to cover. I am still digesting uh, all of the material that was released uh, at 9 a.m. yesterday. You mentioned IC on the record. Just to clarify, that's a website? It's a, it's a Tumblr mm -hmm. website. Um, a year and a half ago, I had no idea what a Tumblr was. Um, but it, it's where we post the documents that we're releasing, speeches. Uh, there'll probably be a link to this uh, up uh, before the close of the business today. Great. Um, and keep your eyes on lawfare. Um, I, uh, there'll be uh, some digesting and uh, summaries of, uh, of what was put out. Um, I want to come back to uh, the issue of protection of, uh, of foreign persons. Um, uh, it does strike me that if you go back in history to the sort of the first great wave of disclosures, uh, uh, about surveillance, uh, the, uh, the, do, uh, the domestic surveillance of, uh, of Martin Luther King, uh, of anti-war activists, including, by the way, uh, the uh, current Secretary of State. Um, Friend of yours? That, uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, uh, that sort of, a, the response was to establish the basic uh, FISA framework, uh, uh, that we're now revisiting today, the a, a, a cabin uh, surveillance of U.S. persons, uh, but uh, to provide uh, far more latitude uh, internationally, and that's, uh, that is, has been the international system. But you know, we're now in a globalized world. Uh, we are in a world in which you know, the, uh, the speed uh, of, and uh, volume of the collection and analysis of information is beyond anything that was imagined at the time of FISA. And uh, we're now uh, addressing that. There's still some open issues. Um, uh, one that is in the materials uh, that was put out is the issue of redress uh, for uh, foreign citizens, uh, rights under the privacy, uh, the Federal uh, Privacy Act. Uh, another has been the uh, sort of debate about articulating limits on, uh, uh, on foreign intelligence collection um, with people on the European side saying that we want a statement that will limit it to what is necessary and proportionate. Um, you know, that's the European legal framework. Under our legal framework, under the Fourth Amendment, the standard is reasonableness. Um, you know, I see this as, in some sense, a semantic to you know, debate about legal semantics. Um, but 
how, how does PPD 28, the standards that have been put into place, uh, address uh, those questions? Well, I think the first, uh, um, in no particular order, um, one of the things obviously is, it, is that the uh, degree to which we are transparent now about what we were doing, I think provides mm -hmm. a more insight into our signals collection activities than virtually any other country in the world affords into their collection activities. Um, I think that the, the limitations on uh, retention uh, and dissemination of personal information about uh, foreign, uh, about non-US persons address that. I think uh, a significant uh, uh, point to mention is the requirement of um, PPD 28 that uh, signals intelligence activity be as tailored as feasible, uh, taking into account the availability of uh, other means of acquiring the same information and, uh, of, uh, and the risks uh, of the collection. Um, I think, I think you, you mentioned the necessary and proportionate standard. That's obviously, that's a standard under European law. I don't think we can be expected to conduct our uh, intelligence activities in accord with European law any more than we would expect Europeans to conduct their activities in accord with our law. Uh, at the same time, as you noted, I think there's a great deal of congruence between the concepts of necessary and proportionate that underlie European law and our uh, requirements of fourth, uh, the Fourth Amendment requirements and the principles that have been articulated in PPD 28. So I, uh, I, do, I do think that, that there should be some comfort taken uh, by this stage of the game that we're not, in fact, um, uh, randomly roaming around uh, listening to uh, communications of, of uh, uh, burgers uh, and at finding out what they're going to have for lunch, but that we're doing appropriate foreign intelligence collection. So we're running short on time, uh, so I do want to turn to the audience, but uh, one more question before we do that. Um, so the existing authority, for Section 215, uh, expires uh, in June. What happens uh, if that sunsets? Um, good question. Um, the president said that he wants to uh, have a mechanism that preserves the essential capabilities of the bulk collection program that we have now without the bulk collection. Um, we, there's a proposal up there that would, would accomplish that, and I'm hopeful that we will get that passed. Um, if, if it sunsets, if it goes away, we obviously, mm -hmm. the, the program will end. We'll also lose uh, other authorities that are important under the same section, um, which had nothing to do with bulk collection whatsoever. Um, so at, at this point, um, we're still far enough away that I think we're not doing extensive contingency planning other than trying to map out the legislative way to get something passed that will um, uh, accomplish the president's goals. Questions? Woo! <laughs> Over here. Yeah, no? Yeah, you don't have to look back. You? Thank you so much. I'm Andreas Ross with the German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. So this is going to be even more about uh, what those Europeans are, are asking you. Sure. Um, could you, could you address what uh, you already mentioned, the question of redress accords for non-US persons, but also the question of selectors, whether um, for a visa surveillance to be, uh, to be targeted, what kind of selectors can be used? You mentioned email addresses and phone numbers, but it seems to be the case that much more general selectors have also been used as are any changes. Uh, envisioned. And if I may, looking forward, after the Paris attacks, there's obviously a whole new debate about exchange of information with the European partners. Um, if you could go into specifics as to what is being searched and to what extent that might be tied to questions about the visa waiver program as is being discussed on the Hill. Thanks. So there's a whole bunch packed into that. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of it. I will tell you that I'm not going to talk about specific information that we're exchanging with our foreign partners. Um, that falls the wrong side of the line for me. I will say that um, before and after Paris, we have a very, very robust intelligence relationship with, with many European countries um, and that in which I think they benefit extensively from our uh, intelligence capabilities and the information we share with them. On the issue of judicial redress, which, which Cam mentioned, um, the, 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 the issue here is that the Privacy Act, which Congress passed, um, specifically applies only to United States persons, does not give any rights to non-Americans. 
We are working on legislation right now um, that we are, we're working on this with members of Congress. I hope to see something introduced soon that will provide for certain categories of data. It will provide uh, individuals who are not Americans the right to come into our courts and, and uh, seek judicial redress either to correct inaccurate information or for a willful improper disclosure. Um, as I said, I'm hopeful that we'll see that sometime in the next few weeks that, that will actually be introduced in Congress. Uh, and we've been, we've been discussing this with uh, representatives of the EU as well. Um, uh, your third point about selectors, I don't think it is correct that um, FISA, so, that selectors under Section 702 are broad in the way that you suggest. I think that uh, in general they're all identify, they're all very specific identifiers. The gentleman in the back there had his hand up a he almost did. before we sat gonna, down here. Right. <laughs> I'm Brian Bennett from the Los Angeles Times. Thanks a lot for speaking about this publicly and answering questions. I wanted to talk w about what's been called the so-called backdoor for collecting uh, electronic data on U.S. citizens. And this is the queries of the 702 data. And my question is, why is a regular warrant or an emergency authorization considered too cumbersome for querying 702 data for U.S. persons? So uh, I, I guess I'd start by saying that I think that's the wrong question. Um, I think the, the, the right question um, is uh, why, uh, under what circumstances should the U.S. government be barred from reviewing information that it's lawfully collected? Um, there are very few such circumstances. If, you, if your barber happens to be the target of a wiretap. Um, we don't need a warrant to find out if you're collected under that. We can just go in and look at it. If your barber happens to be an, an informant wearing a wire and talks with you, we don't need a warrant to search for your communications. If your barber's com computer gets confiscated, we don't need a warrant to look at, or, or he abandons it, we don't need a warrant to look at it for information about you. Generally speaking, the rule is that if we lawfully acquire information, we can search it. We actually restrict ourselves more than that in this case, and I, I articulated some of the rules that we've put into place to ensure that we don't just randomly look through this information, but we do it only when there's, when there's a valid purpose for doing so. And those, uh, it's a, they're, they're a little complicated, so I, I'll, I'll probably screw them up if I try to articulate them here, but they're in the materials that we released yesterday. But I think what's at issue here is exactly what you've been addressing today, which is the public trust. And there's been a presumption that the U.S. government in a criminal investigation or others doesn't query information about U.S. citizens unless there have been another set of eyes on it, either through uh, a regular warrant or an um, emergency authorization. And that doesn't seem to be the case under the 702 I actually don't think queries. that's right. I think that what's happened here is there has been um, a confusion of two concepts. One is when we're allowed to target somebody for collection, and yes, in that case, um, we do need to have a warrant to do it. The other is when we collect information, what can we do with it? And I promise you that the FBI um, has information that it's collected over the years in criminal cases, and it does not need a warrant every time it goes back and reviews its files for information. So as I said, I, I, I don't think your, your question, that the, the premise of your question is, is correct. I think there's been, there's been an effort to try to characterize what's going on here as, as a backdoor search, but I, I just don't think that's an accurate characterization at all. Okay. Ben Willis, uh, Mr. Lawfare. Thanks for coming, Bob. You. Um, you articulated, I think for the first time, a, a, a new set of limitations on the use of 702 data in criminal cases, and you specified categories of crimes in which it would be permissible. I'm wondering, uh, A, how big a change in practice uh, does that require, given the breadth of some of those categories? And B, are you aware of any cases that have been brought criminally in the past that under the new policy uh, the information would not have been able to be used? Yeah. Um, so it, it occurs to me, by the way, that when I gave that list of crimes, people should understand that that is the list of crimes other than crimes with national security implication. So they're, they're, they're basically two buckets. Um, I, there have always been very uh, strong practical considerations against the use of uh, intelligence-derived information in criminal cases. Because if you, 
if you use the intelligence information in a criminal case, you have to uh, expose the capability, you have to litigate it, um, and it's something we always prefer to do. So there have always been um, uh, pretty uh, severe uh, uh, constraints against doing so. Um, and as a result of that, there have been very, very few cases uh, in which I don't know that there is any case in which information actually um, uh, collected under Section 702 has been used. And I think there have not been even that many cases in which information derived from collection under 702 has been used. What this does ensure is that going forward, now that the 702 program is public and, and some of those constraints will be lesser, um, we're only going to use it in, in, in the most serious kind of cases. For example, um, routine drug cases are not on there. Uh, white collar cases are not on there. There's a whole host of activities uh, that are not included. And I think, generally speaking, people would, would agree that the list we have is, is a list of serious crimes. Sir, right there in the, in the sweater. I'm a student at American University. And I was just wondering, uh, due to the current political makeup of our Congress, if you think that President the president's goals will actually be uh, will actually materialize in legislation in Congress, and if not, are there other goals, other security goals, uh, that you think will materialize in legislation? Well, the last part is is kind of a broad question, so I'll, I'll just focus on on, on the first part. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, it's still early on. We haven't really had an opportunity to engage with the Congress yet. The uh, uh, Senator Leahy hasn't reintroduced his bill yet, uh, but I am hopeful that we will be able to um, secure the votes necessary to move this bill or something that, uh, that uh, is close to it. Over here. Thank you, Joe Marks from Politico. Um, uh, Joe Marks from Politico. Um, two quick things. One, you said that um, if uh, there isn't legislation to renew 215 that the program will expire. There's been some talk that there might be ways to continue it in some way. Without that, does this mean that the government will not take advantage of those? And then second, on encryption, um, you seem to suggest that this is something that businesses and the government can work together on fixing. It seems as if, I mean, th that doesn't take account of the real difference between government's goal of gathering data and businesses' need to um, get customers abroad. And can you talk about that? And has there been some discussion with the you know, telecom community about this? So on your first point, um, I don't, as I said, I don't think we've, we've thought a lot about contingency plans. I think that um, if th there's obviously, uh, I don't think I'm revealing any deep secrets here, there's obviously a somewhat su more substantial political hurdle in saying, yes, Congress, we know you didn't reauthorize this, but we're going to go ahead and do it anyway under this authority. Um, uh, we'll just, I, I'm hopeful we never have to uh, confront those issues. Uh, on your second point, I think you've, you've made precisely the point that, um, that I was trying to make, which is to th say, I don't think the interest should be imposed. Frankly, I think that people around the world should, should be comfortable with the concept of a process that gives them privacy and yet allows the government to protect them when it has the lawful authority to do so. Um, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about something that would sort of be a, a, uh, the, an ability to sort of break open anybody's communication, but something that says, okay, um, you can encrypt this, you can send this secure, but if we, get, if we have lawful authority, we have the ability to decrypt it. We're not the only country that wants that. Um, other countries have the same concerns. Um, and I think, I think that this is something where I, I am concerned that the, that the position uh, that, that's being asserted is sort of an all or nothing thing. Either you have full encryption that nobody can break, or you have no encryption whatsoever. Um, as I said, I'm not a cryptographer. Um, I just have to believe that there's a middle ground there where we can provide people privacy reassurances and yet uh, be able to protect them as well. Uh, yes, sir, with the, the blue tie. Hi, uh, Tim Ratter from the German Marshall Fund. Uh, thanks, Bob, for the talk. Um, you mentioned uh, institutionalizing transparency mechanisms. And just to get to your point earlier, I agree that if uh, there had been more transparency before, the public outcry would have been much less. Um, but you know, as technologies change, they create new possibilities, as we've seen, things we couldn't even have imagined even 15 years ago. So what institutional mechanisms are we working on so that when we sort of reach a new era of technology, or whatever you want to call it, that we have these public debates about how to use these tools responsibly? 
Thanks. That's a good question. Um, one of the things we did yesterday was we, we released uh, the this principle of transparency that the DNI has issued for across the intelligence community. And we are working on ways to, to sort of uh, uh, set up processes to implement them. The specific question of what you do about future technologies is, is a tricky one um, because it implicates both, as, both sides of the transparency line that I was talking about. On the one hand, to the extent that what you're talking about is new authorities, new, new generalized capabilities, you're right, there needs to be a debate about that. On the other hand, if you're talking about something which if you disclose it, you lose it, um, that creates a problem. Historically, the way we've dealt with that in this uh, country, the way we've sort of tried to balance the need for secrecy and privacy is through the oversight mechanisms of the intelligence committees in Congress who sort of serve as proxies for the people. And the fact of the matter is the intelligence committees knew everything that, that, that's come out in leaks here. Um, all of these programs were known to them. In fact, they were more broadly known within the Congress. Um, and I think that, that there are going to be certain things which are going to have to be kept at the level of the intelligence committees. And I hope, I think, I think we all recognize that, that you know, strong and vigorous oversight from those committees is, is really essential to try to uh, uh, recreate public trust. We have time for a couple more questions in the back. Thank you very much. I'm Juan Fauza, reporter of El País, a newspaper from Spain. I wanted to ask you, uh, a year after the president's speech, if it has completely ended the uh, monitoring of foreign leaders from countries that are uh, allies and uh, close partners of the U.S., uh, a New York Times article yesterday suggested that the programs in Mexico and Brazil have, have continued. If you could give me a bit of details on this, thank you. So I, I'm not going to comment on any specific uh, collection uh, activities that may not be occurring. Um, we did have an extensive process to review our collection, uh, and we have uh, removed some uh, prior targets for collection uh, against whom we no longer collect. But in terms of more specifics than that, um, that, that gets to the kinds of thing that I don't feel comfortable talking about. Over here. Uh, first, Bob, thank you for coming. My name is Harvey Rushikoff. I'm with the American Bar Association. Um, first, thank you for coming and doing this. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is that you, as a group, would support FISA reform in some sense, uh, FISA court reform. Could you articulate what you, at this point, would like to see in that reform? Well, I think we, we supported the USA Freedom Act. Freedom Act. And as I said, um, there was provision in there to have a, a panel of, of outside lawyers who would be available to the FISA court to help them uh, to help uh, advocate for privacy in appropriate cases. I think there was provision for greater transparency about FISA court opinions. Um, I think those are the, as I recall, those are the two principal areas of, of court reform that were in the USA Freedom Act, and I think those would be appropriate. We have time for one more question. You're, you're the lucky question. Uh, Warren Strobel with Reuters. Bob, thanks for doing this. You mentioned early in your remarks about the possible uh, benefits of transparency beforehand, and I take it you meant before the Snowden disclosures. I've been told there was actually a rather vigorous debate about whether to uh, explain to the American people what was being done under Section 215. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. I mean, what happened? Was it deemed just too politically hard to do? Did the NSA put its foot down? Did it just not happen? So the short answer to that is no. Um, I generally don't like to talk about uh, in internal deliberations, um, and so I won't. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I don't talk about such matters. There was one other that was, general. That was a short one. Way. So, uh, any takers for the last one? Uh, okay, well, thank you. Well, oh, over here. Thanks very much. Hugo Rosemont from King's College London. Um, a grateful European for the greater protections. Thank you. And also, just to ask about the public private cooperation you mentioned and the difficulties around that. And if I understood correctly, some frustration pers personally, potentially, about that. I mean, to what extent should there um, be more structure around this relationship? How can this relationship actually be de developed? That's a very good question. Um, I just, I think we, uh, and, and, and it's a similar question to what your leaders have been, have been raising as well. I think we just have to find ways to engage with them. Um, I think 
there has to be a recognition of where do we have common interests, um, how can we move how can we move those forward, um, and I think there has to be uh, I, I think we have to try to be uh, transparent about it to the extent we can. Uh, well, Bob, I want to thank you for bookending this debate with your July 2013 appearance and then coming here today, um, and for all of the work that uh, that has gone into this. Uh, thank, thanks for hosting this camp. And thank you all for coming.